president have? How long would the country have before the Soviet bombers would start hitting their target? And they really couldn't pick them up until they got to just right about here. There was no radar yet up here until the late 1950s. When? Yeah, maybe an hour. That's not enough time to ask Congress for a declaration of war. So the National Security Act put in this put in as part of the law that the president might have state warlike powers if a threat is imminent. Which, by the way, now the president decides what's an imminent threat. And think about how that's going to change when you have ICBMs. Does anybody know what an ICBM is? Continental ballistic missiles. Yeah. Intercontinental ballistic missiles. If they're picked up flying over the Arctic, we'll come back to ICB. So don't worry, we'll come back to them. We can't help it. We got a lot of Montana. If they're flying over the Arctic, you have about 25 minutes. Wait a minute. I'll tell you about 1979, what happened that year. Trust me. We came about five minutes from you not having to worry about the APS. I'm really glad I didn't know about it at the time. So. But here's another big issue. Oh, before you get that one, when's the last time the president has declared war? I'm sorry, Congress <coughs> has declared war. 1942, when the U.S. declared war on Bulgaria. They were an ally in Germany. Every war we fought since, and Congress has basically just said to the president, do what you want. Most famously, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that got the U.S. into the uh, civil war in South Vietnam. Vietnam war. There are other ones, too, like what happened in Iraq and et cetera. But let's get to this. Also, because of the spies, partially by definition, the United States government, meaning the executive branch, can operate with a veil of secrecy, <coughs> a shadow of government that Congress doesn't even know what the hundred plus billion dollars they give to the NSA and the CIA are even spent on. When that is their constitutional duty, but the idea is we can't let people know because we must keep a veil of secrecy. Now, there's an arguable reason for that once you have spies all over. But how soon do you suppose it would be until the executive branch began to realize, hey, couldn't we use the CIA to start assassinating people? Even if it's against the law at that time, nobody will know because these are all <coughs> secret operations. How soon do you suppose it would be before they had the NSA and the CIA spying on Americans? How long do you suppose it would be until the FBI begins wiretapping? doing sneaking peeks into American homes on political prisoners, people that just didn't like, and gathering files of information they didn't even know about, violating the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. How soon do you think it would be? Six months. The FBI almost immediately started doing that. Truman did not have the CIA do it, but Eisenhower would. In fact, they would help overthrow a democ democracy in Iran just months after Eisenhower took office. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And they would start assassinating people. In fact, the FBI would start gathering files on so many people and use that to extort people, most famously in 1965, when the FBI sent a letter to Martin Luther King to try to blackmail him into committing suicide. And that was the U.S. government, because he was obviously a communist. If he wants equal rights. And that should give you an idea how fast it took. Now, I should add, after September 11th, the law changed, and the CIA assassinates people almost every day. They murder people all the time. I don't know how. Very crude. Is it uh, drones? Yeah, drones with missiles. And the thing about drones with missiles is that there's someone next to the person they're trying to kill, which there's no trial, they just say that that's a target. They're dead too, or horribly wounded. And there's, we don't know how many. We're, since 2008, it's in the many thousands. This will blow back on us someday. I'm old, so it'll more affect you people. Isn't that the great thing with us old people can say, good luck with that? Yes, I think it's all. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they can all justify this by national security. And one more thing. This is the beginning of total war. Now, you're like, and there's like bad movies that all say that this is secret because of national security. <coughs> yeah, President Nixon tried to overturn an election in 1972, this big operation we loved together called Watergate. 
using the CIA and the FBI to overturn an election, and he tried to keep it secret because of national security. Part of the reason Bill Clinton would justify hiding some elements of an extramarital affair he had in the White House was national security. And that goes right to this day about what would happen with, uh, with the investigation on President Trump. And he's desperately trying to keep it a secret. There's probably something really embarrassing in there. Who knows? Maybe something more. But they're part of the reason they just find is national security. And so we begin low grade total war. And this would begin in 48. And I have never known anything different. I know what you think I was born long before that, but you know, I wasn't with the team to talk about for it. And also, it was not as much as ten. Not when I was your age, it was not even close to what it is today. Now, the thing about it is, is that you've never known anything different. That's not an insult. We just, you, you grew up with You know, we have been in the bull gray total war your whole life. With the secret police and spying and investigating, and you've never known anything different. And tracking where you're at and every, what, every place you go. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you have a phone, they're tracking you. And that information goes right to the NSA. I know what most of the people are like. Boy, do we lead boring lives, but occasionally. Okay, so with that, all that starts here. Military spending would go up, and in 1948, the United States would begin its first peacetime military draft. And that would go on till 1973, and the legacy of that goes on to this day. So when soon it'll be young women, but young men go, when they turn 18, what do you got to do? You, you, you don't have to, no, right now. You have to go register for the draft. Where if case there's an emergency, they have this whole pool of names that can call you up. <clears throat> now they don't really need it, now it's just kind of a legacy of it. And they call it more socialism. They actually would buy as many weapons from different man arms manufacturers, manufacturers, arms contractors as possible, especially planes, to keep the companies going. So for example, you would not believe how many different war planes they would buy in the 1950s. To make sure companies like uh, Corvair, not Corvair, uh, Convair, or McDonald, these are companies of the fifties. Douglas, most of them are gone now. Lockheed's still around. Boeing's still around. North America, Grumman. So they could keep these companies going. We bought planes from all over, so that they're always ready to build. So that means that taxpayer more than ever before is going to go to arms contractors. And this is a plan that there's overwhelming forces. We have to do it. Here's a cartoon, it's actually from 69, but it's a pretty good cartoon. Military spending gets basically no real review anymore. It's put, they don't even go through the numbers in Congress. It's basically a number and it's passed. It's actually remarkable. Where domestic spending is, they go through much more carefully. And um, the military budget is always covered and then the rest is divvied out. And you might say we should need more for more domestic needs, but it's still a pretty good cartoon. Herb is one of my favorite cartoons. He did all the way from the late 40s all the way to he quit. God, 2008, right until he died. He has really good cartoons. But while this is going on, part of the reason all this happened is the Cold War became hot. Sorry, that was that was the old joke when they were actually shooting each other. It's horrible, isn't it? The Berlin blockade. And what happened was this. The British, the French, and the Americans, what was the plan for economic aid of Western Europe? What do we call it? Commercial land. So if they're going to rebuild Western Europe, they got to start with a common currency. Those occupation zones got to have a financial system to start rebuilding it before they're using just a hodgepodge of, they call it script. The Germans would, or the, the British would issue a script, the French would issue a script, etc. So they made a common currency, the Deutsche Mark, which would be the German currency until 2002. What's it now? They're in the euro, which functions very much like the gold standard, so it's problematic. But once you create a currency, start collecting taxes, and that you basically created the country. And this would be the beginnings of West Germany. So when I was growing up, it was West Germany, and then soon the Soviets were East Germany. The problem was this. Remember Stalin's greatest fear. They're going to rearm Germany and send them back, and this is what he thought was going on. This has all been a plot. The areas, and this was the most industrialized region of Germany, was in the West. 
They're coming back. It's the greatest population here. But remember the Allied occupation zones of Berlin are the Soviet occupation zone. And so what the Soviets did is they blockaded the land routes. So there's a British, French, and American. They each had a railroad, an autobahn, and an air route. They blockaded the air, I'm sorry, they blockaded the railroad and road. And each zone had a little airport, but actually really small. Now this is like a park. So my sister-in-law, uh, my wife's sister, married a Berliner, and he grew up right next to Temple Off Air, about a quarter mile from the wall. And there were 4,000 American troops there at all times growing up, 4,000 British, 4,000 French. And as he he see convoys going <coughs> off the time, off the clear road, American convoys going by. That's what he grew up in. And the land, air routes were open, but the Soviets believed correctly, they thought, no way they could, re, they could bring in supplies and coal to heat not only the soldiers, but the almost 3 million civilians in this area, too. <clears throat> this looked like an act of war. And Stalin, though, was giving them a choice. Kind of clever, but pretty crude, too. If you want West Germany, you lose what we're going to call West Berlin, or vice versa. If you want to keep occupation of West Berlin, then you've got to give up the Deutschmark. Give up West Germany. The United States not only refused, they began the air route. It started out pretty haphazardly, but within a couple of months, there was a corridor, three separate corridors of planes almost continuously, mostly American and British planes, flying into Berlin. And I love the this cartoon, I just couldn't resist. The Soviet air with his arms crying up. I couldn't resist that one. And see the kids? See what they're standing on? Piles of rubble. They would take, I mean, these piles of rubble were everywhere. And there's actually one spot in the Berlin Zoo, the Berlin Zoo is huge, where there's a pile of rubble that forms a mountain over 60 feet tall. And they put it kind of dirt over it's that grass. And they, Berlin's really flat. And then they got these three mountains. It's all the rubble from there. And American and British pilots would drop the little kids' candy, things they flew in. You know, they, you know, they give the, the the West Berlin or kids a little bit of something, and it worked. Not only were they able to get just enough supplies in to survive, this humiliated the Soviets, and also the West Germans began to really appreciate the United States. They're no longer, U.S. and British are no longer occupiers. They're protecting them. And so the Soviets backed down. This would be a humiliating defeat for Stalin, and this is when Berlin would become the focal point of the Cold War. And we got that the focal point of the Cold War. And let's jump right to this. So they created the United States would escalate things right after it created a military alliance with a very innocuous name of the North American Treaty Organization, NATO. This is a military alliance that still exists today, a pact. And in 1955, the U.S. would help, would allow Germany, West Germany to rearm, and soon they'd have an army of over a million men. They'd soon be making the best tanks in the world, the Leopard and the Leopard II, which is the best tank in the world now. And the Soviets would respond in 1950, uh, 1955, after Stalin died, with the Warsaw Pact. That was their military lines. When I was a kid, it was always Warsaw Pact versus NATO, and this is the kind of map I saw as a kid. Blue, red. <clears throat> One more conference we got to get to, and I know the bill is about ready to ring, but I really got to get to this. It's called Bretton Woods. And Bretton Woods would set up a very stable monetary system. A stable, remember right down, it's stable monetary system based upon the dollar. Until the 1970s, based upon the dollar, and what's liberal economics called again? Keynesian. Keynesian or demand side. Until the 1970s, when conservative economics would begin to take that part. There's inflation, oil prices went up, Bretton Woods, stable monetary system. And so this is an era of really stable, almost constant, sometimes spectacular growth. China or uh, Japan was spectacular in the 1960s. Now, I put a few things, but don't worry. 
I'll have you guys a monetary system we're all getting. Monetary system based upon the dollar. And you know what the GI Bill is? That would be created in 1944 for veterans, you know? Yeah, for veterans to go to college and for their kids to go to college. At first it was just for veterans. Remember Roosevelt wanted basically no tuition for public schools? Couldn't get that. But liberal Democrats and liberal Republicans in 44 did it for veterans. And you know how many veterans it's going to be? 15 million. Conservatives oppose this. This goes against trickle on economics, and conservative Southerners thought it would go to blacks. Racism. Remember that there? Jim Crow. And never seems to go away. It's in cities. GI Bill is a big deal. And then it was expanded a few times. Democrats in Congress had big expansion in the early 2000s. We're expanding money for college and also more money for children. Anybody have that for kids? So a few. And uh, yeah, my, my dad got that. It's a big deal. Seven. So on the DBQ, yeah. I feel like on the document, uh, I try to like make sure I specifically get half because at the time I don't get half, and I think I'm getting it, but I don't. So I, I can't really hear it specifically. I, mean, I can't remember. But I think like maybe if you're just specifically, I wrote down the half for Okay, you know, this is good about stopping the uh, war in my family. So you're right, you know, yes, you know, stopping the war. That's stuff if I go to one bed. Thank you. 